welcome to Three Night Weekend, where we prepare you for the weekend to come with the help of gaming industry luminaries. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can find me on the world's most advanced gaming website, Sifted, at sifted.net, or on Twitter, at Dinfire. If you want to support the show, head to patreon.com slash sifted. The show goes live every Friday morning for our patrons, and the following Monday for everyone else. This week, we're talking to Greg Kasavin. He was the editor-in-chief at GameSpot during its glory days, moved to work at publishers like EA and Take-Two before landing at Supergiant, the studio behind Game of the Year candidate, Hades. All right, and here we are with a person I would consider one of my mentors in the gaming industry. We're speaking with Greg Kasavin, one of my very first bosses in games journalism. Greg, welcome to Three Night Weekend. Hey, Shane, thank you for having me on here. It's good to, good to see you again. Yeah, I just want to say before we get going that um, the things that you taught me, I was a fresh out of college with a journalism degree, and the things that you taught me in my first couple of years in the industry have paid dividends in a lot of ways across the years. Uh, the ideals that you, that you kind of taught me about how to handle games editorial have sustained throughout my entire career. Um, I would say that it was more successful in the early days than it is now. I feel like editorial integrity is something that's not as important as it used to be back when we worked together. Uh, but that's a whole different discussion. Uh, we want to talk about you today. You have had an amazing journey through the games industry. You were the editor-in-chief of GameSpot when I worked there. Uh, and then you moved on to work in game development, which isn't, at the time, it was kind of a new thing. But since then, it has become almost kind of a normal career path. Honestly, it's kind of crazy how it's worked out that way. I have not followed that path. Uh, I've talked to too many of you guys to know I want nothing to do with game development. <laughs> so I've continued to cover games. Uh, Greg, let's talk about your early days, though. What got you interested in and involved in games journalism in the first place? Yeah, um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we were really uh, learning as we went in uh, back in those GameSpot days. And it's it's funny, you know, you, you hear it, it's great to hear that um, it it left a lasting impression on you like that. that um, and I sometimes hear, you know, from from readers once in a while where they're like, oh, those, you know, those were the days or something. I think if they grew up, you know, with PS2s and GameCubes, it's it's more likely to have left a an impression that way. But it's like we were always just kind of um, it, it, it was never a time when you could kind of rest easy. It was so much uh, to do. And, and our, and our kind of mandate at the time was literally to review every game. I know uh, it's, it's <laughs> unimaginable right now. And gr granted, I mean, the, the number of games available today is probably like a thousand fold greater. At so least, it's like, at least threefold for sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, legitimately. <laughs> at least I mean, legitimately yeah. probably threefold. Yeah, I'm I'm including like whatever like mobile games and stuff like that in there. Yeah, in my Which a lot uh, of us don't even know exist. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was still yeah, it was still a lot, and we had a you know our team was was like of a modest size, and we were just yeah. I mean, grinding I, I have, is what we were doing, Greg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good word for it. But but to your question, I mean, I'm I'm really, I I started writing about games like in high school, kind of fresh out of high school. Um, I always wanted to make games since I was a little kid. I was like eight years old um, playing an old RPG called Ultima 4, kind of the the grand, the grand great grandfather, I would say, of, you know, it's still like modern uh, Western RPGs, like whatever, Bethesda games and yeah. Witcher and stuff like that, I think owe a lot to the Ultima series. Um, and it blew my mind uh, that that there could be this, you know, big kind of open world game where your choices have consequences. You could kind of do whatever you want, go wherever you want. It was just amazing to me. Uh, but I, I played all, all sorts of games. I, I was lucky to have, you know, access to, I play arcade games, um, console games, whatever I could get my hands on. And I was playing games like so much in high school that I, uh, you know, it, it started to I think a combination of guilt, maybe a little parental pressure. I'm like, I need to do something productive with this. <laughs> but but my attempts to um, teach myself programming just were not successful. Uh, I tried uh, over the years multiple times. It's just, I don't know, my brain did not feel wired for it, which I think is probably a bit of a fallacy. Like anyone can, anyone can learn programming if you kind of put your mind to it. Um, but it's I, easier now than it was back then. It may, maybe so. Yeah, for sure. Aspects of uh, learning game development are easier now when you could just like 
uh, download Unity or something and start doing yeah. tutorials and making stuff happen. You don't um, have to do but, everything from scratch now. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, but I loved writing, and so I got to. Um, I I started basically. I was on the fledgling uh, internet at the time. I met a friend uh, across the country, similar kind of tastes and interests in games, and we started making like a little fanzine, like an actual printed, you know, <laughs> like printed on, on paper. paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mailed to people, um, mailed to people, you know, via snail mail um, with, with like game reviews and stuff like that. And that led me to um, my first, like basically my first job was at a publication called New Type Gaming um, that uh, very fortunately was in San Francisco. So I, I lucked out a big, like a lot of it, I attribute a lot to luck because I, I was living, uh, going to school. You made in San a Francisco fanzine and... that you printed on paper, Greg. I, I don't think it's luck, buddy. Well, the part, <laughs> the the part where- to do that. Here's the part that is crazy luck. Um, so, so I had these kind of initial little writing gigs um, as like, you know, whatever. I was probably 17 at the time. And um, I'm starting to kind of mess around on, you know, I'd been part of the internet, like uh, already um, publications were starting to transition from print to, you know, having an online presence. Mm -hmm. I hear about something called GameSpot um, and, and, and they're launching, you know, instead of these small little kind of hobbyist websites, somebody's launching kind of a gaming website for real. They've got, they've got a real team. Um, you, you know, they've got former editors from like Next Generation Magazine, you know, editors with clout. Yeah. And and it turned out that GameSpot's headquarters was like ba basically only like a 30 minute walk from where I was living. So that part was really serendipitous. Um, it was just kind of down on I still pass by the old uh, the first office from time to time. So I wrote uh, I reached out to them and, and basically it led to an internship there. Uh, even, I tried to make myself, you know, bigger than I was uh, yep. and had had some writing samples to show for myself. And they're like, oh, what, you know, you interested in an internship? It was actually like a paid internship, which was amazing um, even for the time. Um, and so I, you know, I started like making basically kind of my first real job, you know, um, getting to review games and stuff like that. And I was in college at UC Berkeley at the time. Uh, I was very tempted to drop out um, because things were going well for me at, at GameSpot. And I was really like excited about that work. Um, and meanwhile, college was, was rough. What was um, your major? At uh, I majored in English. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so not, not journalism, but um, kind of a, you know, related writing, yep. re uh, writing uh, focused uh, major. And um, my own, you know, the, the person I consider my own mentor there at the time, Ron Doolin, uh, he he encouraged me to essentially to stay in school. The job would be there, you know, when I was done. Mm -hmm. And, um, Great and that's how, yeah, it was. Um, it was. I, I learned, you know, in turn, whatever whatever kind of values you mentioned that I espoused, I like. I think I took a lot of that from Ron. Um, Ron. So in some Ron, ways, he was kind of my mentor too. <laughs> for sure, I think you know that's you how remember. It works, though. And I passed yeah. what you taught me down to a lot of editorial folks that were working under me across the years. That's how it goes, you know. Yeah, for for sure, it's like you 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 kind of come into those situations and your instincts kind of get reinforced by. Sometimes it can go the other way, right? Like the kind of you know the 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 leadership or whatever the the values you're like it just feels wrong it's like no this doesn't this doesn't seem right at all but once in a while yeah you you kind of uh, get to get to work with somebody who just reinforces what what you feel to be and what you're taught in all honesty, right. you know, I yeah. had a journalism degree and I listened to my professors talk about it for four years to work someplace where that was reinforced. Uh, yeah. It was first of all, encouraging to me, having spent a lot of time and money in college uh, to learn that what I had had absorbed in school, I could put into practice yeah. in my career. Uh, it felt good, to be honest with you. Yeah, that is that is really good, especially, you know, because I didn't I didn't have a formal, you know, I didn't have a journalism background myself. Yeah. And, and yeah, the fact that, you know, fast forward, basically, yeah, I kind of, um, after, after I graduated, I went to work at GameSpot full time um, and ended up working there for more than 10 years. And it was one of those things where like, yeah, I mean, when I started as an intern, 
uh, I, I couldn't have really imagined that I would wind up, you know, editor in chief one day and be there for 10 years or, or whatever. But the, the time went by really fast. And as you said, it was like, it was an intense place to work. There, there was, there was never really, uh, there was never really any downtime. Uh, you I could would never say. exhale. Yeah. Even, even like over the holidays, we'd have to plan our game of the year stuff. And I was typically one of the people to, you know, make sure all that stuff went up. And uh, so, so but even, even that, around Greg, yeah. how we handled our game of the year <laughs> discussions, that's how we ended up handling our game of the year discussions at all the publications where I was running editorial. Yeah, no, that's cool. I have fond memories of, of those discussions. Actually, they were, uh, I mean, we just pile into a room and, and just and go hammer it. it out. Yeah. Yep. It's, I love, uh, you know, the, we still, some of the folks we worked with, um, they're still, they're, they're still, you know, in the kind of in the mix with, uh, like a giant bomb and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And they still, I love that they make the process kind of even more transparent than we did where they just they actually record, publish the discussion. Yeah. They record the entire thing. So you have kind of yeah. full transparency into the deliberations, which, which I find is, is really cool. And, um, I, I, I would have, I would have been all for uh, something like that. I, I, I feel like, yeah. um, but yeah, it's, you know, the time went by so quickly that I, I just, um, I, I fell, in, I wouldn't have done it for that long if I, if I didn't love it. Uh, but, but I basically did start to feel this kind of anxiety around, um, I, I, I'm no closer to getting into game development. And if this, if this is my childhood dream, it's still kind of like sticking with me in, in an annoying way. And I felt like I had to at least try it. Um, and maybe I'd go, you know, chances are I'd come crawling back or something like that, but I knew I'd regret <laughs> it if I, if I didn't try it. Um, and, and yeah, I finally, you remember, uh, Amira Jami, right? Yes. Like he's from, yeah. So he was, once, he was the first to leave for development from, he game was, game, right? yeah, he, he, EA, correct? he did, he yeah. did go to, yeah. So uh, Amira Jami was like our, um, our previous editor, uh, focused yep. on, uh, on PC games. Great um, guy. Yeah, he he was, and he he, he got still an is, I'd imagine. <laughs> yes, he still is for a fact. while. <laughs> no, he's he's doing well actually. He's he's there with um many. What's awesome is um he still works with many of the folks from that same team. Um, after like like I at you know at Supergiant, I um Supergiant was founded by two of the folks from that team, and and then you know uh, I'm I'm there as well. So a small splinter group from that Command and Conquer team went to do super giant, but, but a big, like, um, a big chunk of them are, are still together, which I find is really wonderful because they've been together now and for rare. probably close to 20. In, in this yeah, industry, it's, it's rare. rare to work with it the is. same people for that long. Yeah. So they work on, they do, they do make a uh, mobile game. They, they work on, uh, like Marvel strike force stuff like it's so pretty actually like very successful mobile. Yeah, games, I mean, a lot of my friends, yeah. those are like their favorite games. Yeah. Those um, mobile, like star Wars, like, yeah, they're Turn based RPGs based on big IP. A lot of my casual friends, that's what they play. Yeah, that stuff is like, I mean, they're made by really big teams at this point. They're like yeah. pretty, pretty fancy um, productions. They but, generate a lot of revenue. Yeah, that and that too. <laughs> um, so so it was Amira Jami who who like, you know, told told me, you know, I stayed in contact with him after he left. And he's like, hey, there's a producer opening um on the on the command and conquer team they were working on command and conquer 3 at the time it's a series i enjoyed um a lot and and i applied for it and i got it um th and this and i left at the beginning of 2007 so i so i've now been in game development for longer than um than i was in the gaming press but time time is funny that way and you know it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't uh, time kind of accelerates the older you get it seems it really so, does it so really it doesn't, does yeah it doesn't feel like i've been doing this stuff i like i i i think i felt like more proficient in some ways at at gamespot than in game development where it's like yeah it's still <laughs> it's its own struggle uh, kind of never it never has felt like it got easier in in any way, but it's certainly it's really. Um, but don't you think that's compelling? It is. I, I think I think that is at the heart of why it's interesting. Because I yeah. have certainly gotten to a point with covering games where I feel like everything, not just myself, but everything, has kind of reached a zenith. Like once we got to the let's plays and that type of coverage. Things haven't changed that much since then. That's true. And it does feel like things are a little bit on autopilot. And you're right. You need new challenges to stay engaged. Um, and it can be tough when everything feels stagnant. And in all honesty, a lot of new ideas that you try 
in covering games anymore get rejected. Everyone just kind of seems to want the same thing. Yeah. Um, lots of talking head stuff, lots of let's play stuff. Um, not a lot of editorial based stuff to be perfectly honest. Yeah. With you. It's, um, it, it is interesting. You know, when, when, um, once you've been around kind of long enough, it is, uh, I, 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 I'm fascinated by the kind of comparison. I make the comparison myself that, you know, when I was getting started, there was a lot of, um, I think there was a lot of like fear from uh, kind of established print publications about these, you know, upstart uh, websites. It's like, right. what are these guys, <laughs> you know, th these guys don't have any, you know, they don't have any values. They don't have any integrity. They don't know what it takes and so on. And yet websites, you know, started to kind of eat, eat the lunch of, of uh, print publications. They could, they could produce, you know, the timeliness. More... <laughs> yeah. The timeliness was huge and, and, and they could, and they could, um, and video as well. And also just like uh, length, uh, yeah. you know, you could, you could write a review that was as long as it needed to be instead of like squeezing the whole thing into 600 words or something like yeah, that. It's true. There's a, there's an art to concise writing, of course, but absolutely. Um, yeah. But sometimes I, I think it are, you know, back in our day uh, in, in GameSpot, I think when it's like, Oh boy, a three page review, you know, for halo or something like that, people would gobble. People were very excited to dig through, you know, a long, yeah written review the so more detail the better yep, yeah yeah exactly so so now you know of course when when like um streaming and 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 let's plays and and kind of youtube started to rise kind of rise to glory in in more recent years um it felt like the old kind of established websites were kind of under under a under attack i guess the times were changing for them much like how the times were changing for print publications I, I think that's accurate yeah. completely yeah, and, and I think similarly, like you, you, you know, YouTubers, some of those streamers and stuff I watch, it's like they're some of the hardest working people I've ever yeah, seen. Absolutely. Or, yep. Yeah. I think my big concern coming from where we come from is editorial oversight. Um, working yeah. with publishers on the side, that sort of thing, when there's no one there to watch what they're doing and make sure that they're kind of following the straight and narrow. There's yeah. wiggle room there that I felt like I didn't have working under you per se. Like, you know, right. Knowing the, that you there were was... there, I minded my P's and Q's at all times. And I yeah. would hope that at the publications where I was the EIC or whatever, that the people working under me felt like, man, I got to I got to toe the line here. Or Shane is going to bust my balls, you know, so, <laughs> and you don't get right. that anymore. If you're a YouTuber working from home or whatever, you have nobody kind of watching over your shoulder. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a concern to me. But honestly, I don't think the audience cares. And that's really what matters. <laughs> yeah, they're they're ultimately, you know, they they have to figure out where that line is for themselves. And they um, their their audience can smell BS in many cases. So mm -hmm. I, I it is it is really tough uh for them because they have to like figure there's no one you know they have to find uh either figure it out on their own or find some kind of mentorship around like how to navigate all that because i think i think they're anyway as you say it's a whole <laughs> it's a whole can of uh, like can of worms and big discussion topic but um yeah it's it's a you know i i my heart goes out to people trying to make it happen in that in that space because like i said they're just so, so streamers them especially are, the yeah, team. they're they got a no know, seven days a week, same time. Like, man, <laughs> no, extremely hard work. That is not for me. I'm way too old for that at this point, Greg. Yeah, I've been watching the same like Hearthstone streamers now, like for for years, and they're you know they're like part of my whatever you know part of my week or something like that. Oh, tune in and li listen to these guys. You know, it's it's that interesting experience of like they almost feel like friends, even yeah, though never absolutely met them. like a radio personality yeah, as well for but, sure yeah. now greg so you moved over to ea to work on the command and conquer team were there any immediate regrets of moving <laughs> into game development where you were like oh my gosh this isn't what i thought it was going to be what have i done anything um, like that i i no i don't think i if there was something like that i think i've like blocked it from my from my memory i was pretty i was pretty fired up um about it um i was mentioning you know before we before we started this call, I was actually commuting uh, to Los Angeles from Northern California, which is um, so brutal. It, yeah, it's <laughs> it was weird. It was one of those things that I thought was going to be temporary. Oh, you know, it'll be a couple of weeks. Oh, it'll be uh -huh. a couple of months. Oh, it'll be a couple of years. You yeah, know, it just kept going um, on. Yeah. yeah, just kept going on. We never like kind of found a permanent uh, residence down in L.A. And I um, and it was just a weird time in the industry where I, I didn't know like between projects, especially, uh, it's like, you don't know what's going to happen, what you're going to, if you're going to have uh, a job, 
yeah, or like what your job is going to be, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. After after Command and Con you know, I joined at the at the tail end of Command and Conquer three, so it was clear what we were rolling onto after that. And then Red Alert three was the first game I worked on start to finish. Um, and then and then we we worked on a small expansion pack for it that that was done in like four months flat, which is wow. uh, amazing to think back on. That is. Uh, um, and then from there, um, things kind of from there things became very murky as to what. Uh, would be our team's future despite this team being like a very um it was a very like kind of high performance team that had been belting out these hit games for a while but things changed and yeah yeah for me i think i felt you know be, because of like like amira jami um helped me to meet people there and just help me kind of navigate this new environment but it, it was definitely really scary for me because i'd never i i'd kind of like not worked in another environment for more than 10 years. So just, just having to meet a whole new group of people is, it wasn't, and kind of figure out what makes them tick and all that kind of stuff that that's inherently um, pretty kind of scary and challenging, but I, I was very excited um, also. And I felt like I could, I, you know, I, I, I felt like quite welcome there. Um, I was, I was, uh, it was cool to see how much, um, I didn't know that people kind of, uh, I, I didn't have any assumptions about how like game developers felt about a website like GameSpot or something like that. But, but, <laughs> was but it I interesting getting that perspective from the other side? <laughs> it was like, I, like, I didn't know how much, oh boy. And th this is like, still did true. Did they but care? But yeah, probably... <laughs> they care. They care a lot. They cared a lot about Metacritic, which I think is more uh -huh. publicly known now. Yeah. But I'm like, man. They really care about review scores. More well, the than bonuses, I... at least back then, were kind of tied into the scores in some ways at some publishers. Yeah, I think that that was the case um, at, at some places. I, do, I don't think that that was the case on our team, but our team did like value quality. And it was a way to like it was a way to, to measure, you know, critical consensus, critical quality it, it, that, that they could like, you know, refer to when speaking to an executive or something like that. Like everybody there knew that quality was more than just review scores. But, you know, if you make a game that has a whatever 9.0, 9 90 Metacritic, that's like a pretty good indicator. No, you're on that, the right track. Yeah, exactly. And I would argue back then that Metacritic held a little more weight than it does now because back then there weren't as many publications. Most of the publications were structured editorial departments with oversight, like the places that we had worked at. Now Metacritic, it's... I'm actually interested to get your perspective on this. Now, Metacritic, for each game, there's like a thousand reviews. Whereas back then, literally, there'd be maybe 40 or 50. Which do you think better represents um, your game? And which way do you like? did you like better? Having fewer um, publications or more? I mean, I think the, the spirit of things like Metacritic do benefit from like a larger sample size. Um, I, I've never worked on games that got you know, the, um, I, I don't remember there being a huge numerical sort of disparity between between then and now, but I do work on smaller games. So maybe I just don't have as much awareness of games that get like, hun you know, hundreds of Metacritic reviews or something like that. Um, I think there's a lot more kind of international representation on Metacritic, which I, yep. again, I, I think I think is is a is a good thing. It's yeah. just it's it's more indicative of different points of view. Um, if nothing else, cultural differences, and, things. Like yeah. That. And, yeah. And those are, or even just like, oh, this game has a busted, you know, translation or something. So right. it's worse, yeah. worse reviews overseas. It's like, that's, that's a valid, a, a valid issue, you know, when, when comparing games in that way. But I, I, I you know, I still feel like um, one, one of the things, you know, I would always think about at GameSpot was like every high review score makes it harder for the next game to score as high because the, st the standard literally goes up when a game like, you know, Zelda breath of the wild or God of war or uncharted Four, whatever those games like raise the standards um, and, and make it harder for another game to, to be as like well received. Um, Greg, I have never given a perfect 10 in my entire career. Yeah. I never, I never did either. Um, Not once I've been doing yeah. it for 23 years. I've never given a game a perfect 10. <laughs> Yeah, there's always something. I mean, it's like I I agree. I had I had the same experience. I gave some very high, you know, whatever. Very yeah, me too. I've nines, given lots but... of nine point fives and higher, but I've never hit that perfect ten. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I've played such a game either. Uh, that I there are games I love dearly. I could still, Find I can still note note. Yeah. yeah, just be like, 
you know, whatever. I, I can reconcile that. It's like sometimes it's just part of the personality of the game. It might technically be a flaw or something like that, but it's like, ah, oh, that's part of what makes this game interesting in some way that it has this kind of weird issue that maybe doesn't make sense. Um, that's a good point. <laughs> but um, anyway, the um, so I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we still we do you know when we release a game we do we do look at the the metacritic n not to obsess over it but just like what did what did everybody say i still you know coming from that background i still really value um what game critics have to say about our work uh, it's it's a good way of gauging like did the thing as a game developer what's really useful about reviews is like what did the things that stood out about your work were they the things that you actually focused on or were there things that you were like un unconscious to uh -huh. um, and so, something i really value is when is when reviews sort of highlight things that we did indeed focus on deliberately during development it's like okay good we thought that was important we we put and a bunch is. of stuff into it <laughs> and and that that is indeed what what stood out to someone you know about the work but sometimes yeah it, it, you know a critic may be um maybe caught up on some particular detail and it's like, ah, you know, I, I never, never even occurred I never realized that, or I didn't notice yeah. that. Or like, you know, I hoped that I, I think a very frequent response to that game developers, I think broadly know what they're shipping. Um, they, you've seen all sorts of reactions. You just kind of hope that people will be on the m more positive side of glass of the half things full you, versus glass half. Yeah, yeah. But you don't, you don't really know. And so typically when, when, do you yeah, think I they think... are? Do you think game critics generally are glass half full or glass half empty? Uh, I think they're glass half full. Okay. In, if I have to sort of make a sweeping generalization, because, and that's referring to like the 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 enthusiast press, so to speak, because mm -hmm. like that's why 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 like you can't you can't keep doing it for very long if you don't like love games yep. on a on a fundamental level. Um, and I know, you know, God, I, I don't think I could have survived in, I know a lot of the, the discussions around like game criticism, they, they remind me of the ones that we were having at, at the time. It's like, just because you gave a game, you know, a less than stellar review, it doesn't mean you don't love games. It, right. like, it, yeah. it often means uh, the opposite. It's like, you can be critical of things you love. You can find yep. problems and things you love. So these are still... I, I've I've kind of made peace. It, I used to get like really frustrated that that same discussion would happen over and over. And I made peace with it of like, oh, it's actually kind of generational changes in many cases. It's just like games are, you know, still draw a lot of younger players. And for many players, they like, you know, they're having that realization for the first time, even though, you know, someone like you or I may have had that <laughs> realization, you know, a couple of decades ago or yep. something. I mean, um, that's been a struggle yeah. for me as a games critic is a lot of, genres that i've played like uh 2d platformers that i have played just thousands of them at this point yeah i really need something new or creative in these games for it to light a spark inside me as the player but right. it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that a lot of people who are going to watch your coverage or read your coverage are 13 and they've yeah. played five of them and that has been a struggle for me is realizing that not everyone is like me. They haven't been playing games since the seventies. They haven't played a million of these things. And so a lot of the features in these new games aren't new to me, but they are right. to everybody else or to a yeah. lot of, a lot of people who are just starting to play. So it's, it's been a challenge. I think that's probably been the biggest challenge for me as someone who's been doing it for a long time, trying to create content for people who maybe are in their teens or early twenties and haven't experienced as many games. Yeah. As yeah, that totally makes sense. I still, you know, a lot of my own references I think about do come from that, like, you know, e either our kind of GameSpot time or or the or the '90s or something. Yeah, you, you know, th these were the formative experiences for me. You know, playing Super Nintendo games or something like that. Yeah, and I can still see, you know, echoes of those games in a lot of games I play uh, today. And I think in many cases those are still like, it, like the purest examples of certain types of ideas because they didn't have you know much of anything else uh to go on so uh, but but um yeah to a new player today you know they they haven't they don't have that frame of reference and we have yeah it's you have you know, to calibrate even, <laughs> yeah. it's like how do you do that <laughs> we meet people you know even for us like at super giant we've now been around for more than 10 years and 
you know, at PAX or, or it is, yeah, <laughs> at PAX or something like that, we'll be like, you know, we'll meet like a grown ass adult, but the person will be like, oh yeah, I played Bastion in middle school. It was, you know, so memorable. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, you know, um, because that's awesome. Yeah, though. Because the difference between like an eight year old and an eighteen year old is like, oh my god, that's yeah, that's your yeah. whole. That happens life. with us with X Play a lot. Yeah, people are yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. watched that when I was in grade school, and I'm yeah. like, oh wow, <laughs> you're like in your thirties yeah. or whatever. It's well, back to our uh, back to the you know time accelerating thing, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Greg, you ended up leaving EA eventually. Why did you leave EA? Yeah, that w- um, I left EA. Um, I left EA to stabilize my life um, because I had been commuting for more than two and a half years. Um, and I found a job opportunity at 2K Games uh, up here in Novato. So 20 minute commute wow. um, as opposed Versus to uh, six four. hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that was really and and I was a big fan of 2K. They they yep. um, Bio- Bioshock was a game that left a really strong impression on me uh, at the time. Actually, it was one of the games. Still, before it came it out. still leaves a strong yeah. impression on me. That was one of the games that made me. It was like E3 2000. Five. That sounds uh, right. where where um where I think both Bioshock and the first Assassin's Creed were like shown were unveiled for the first time and and those games just they blew my mind seeing those games for the first time and I felt this like intense uh that that feeling of like I I don't know how people are making this stuff I just want to be a part of something like this yeah. uh, someday. So my my um, my kind of anxiety around trying to get into game development sparked right back up uh, from seeing those games. But yeah, I um, EA like our our project at EA had also been um, been recently uh, canceled. At that point, it was not it never announced, and and we were kind of like things were kind of flagging for us on that team, um, and so it seemed like a good time uh, to move on. Um, it was around the same time, actually shortly before, that Amir and Gavin, uh, who were two of my friends and colleagues from that team, had had dropped everything and moved into moved up to San Jose, which is about 90 minutes from here in Northern California uh, of a drive, uh, and uh, started Supergiant in the living room of Amir's dad's uh, house. Who <laughs> Amir's dad was not living there at the time, so they had they basically had a place to live and and work and i i had been you know uh, amir was one of my roommates in la like we we had been talking about independent games and what we would do for a really long time and playing these games like braid and castle crashers and plants vs zombies Mm -hmm. world of goo those were like the four games from small studios that came out in a relatively short like relatively same time period um and they just were were amazing to us um and and kind of inspired us to see what could be done as a, as a smaller team, but I wasn't there from the start. I, I ended up joining them. I didn't think, I didn't feel like with my whole like kind of family situation and everything, the idea of going from my LA situation to like working at a startup company, 90 minutes away with uh, maybe not a lot of benefits. Yeah. It, it was, kid and yeah, yeah. Another, I, I had already taken, um, well, Supergiant became my third uh, successive pay cut. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I took a pay cut for EA. I took a pay cut for 2K, and then and then that Supergiant. You know, they there was all it was all like self funded. So we basically had no money. Um, I had to mooch off my my parents for the first time since I was like 17, and I'm re- really grateful that I even had that option. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh. It, but yeah. So I I I reunited with them. Basically, I I was only at 2K for about a year, and then joined a super giant just as Bastion was going into full. What did you work on at 2K, Greg? I worked on a game called Spec Ops: The Line. Oh um, wow, uh, that's yeah. what you just you act like nobody knows what that game oh, is. I'm I, I'm glad I'm that's glad a groundbreaking it has a, game that's still it, talked about today. I love I love that it has like its kind of cult following. Uh, at the time, it was yeah, it was like a. Um, the the kind of vision behind it, it's a game that spent a long time in in development. So uh-huh. I I, um, I I sort of deserve very little credit for for that game, though I really um, I I was really like excited about the premise of it, um, and um, am still friends with some of the folks I I worked with on it. It gave me an opportunity to travel to Germany because the developer uh, is Jaeger. They're based in Berlin, um, so I would visit. The, yeah, so I went from commuting. To, you know, I spent up to a month in in Berlin, uh, 
uh, on that project. So it's still a plenty of travel and being away from home, but it did uh, help me stabilize um, after, after the EA situation. So uh, yeah, game development has been, it's been a real roller coaster more than like the, the, the highs and lows, I think the, like the lows have been lower for me than at, than at GameSpot and the highs of I, I suppose have been higher with, with something like Bastion and, in our in our subsequent games because it 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 felt good that as a small team we could make something that that um that stood out to people basically that we you know our our sort of our theory or our it wasn't a theory it's something we wondered it's like could we actually make something worth a damn as a small team and and when 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 the results come in and the 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 evidence is that yes you made something worth a damn it's like oh, awesome and for me now, how um, far along yeah. was bastion when you came onto the team there was um there was we basically had uh we were just getting preparing our like 20 minutes uh pax demo there was okay. a lot of um a lot of the first year was spent on getting like foundational aspects of it to even function like mm -hmm. having a character that you can control and right. you can swing a hammer when you press a button um and uh but yeah like the whole we we went to that pax prime in 2010 to show the game for the first time and it got a really really good it was a really memorable experience because the game got a great response was the um, narration in the game already the, at that the narrate the narration was just like was just beginning basically okay. so it was it was it was not there um at the at it was not there as like a foundational part of the game um but but sort of like was was um was something that came along through the course of prototyping where uh, you know we wanted to tell we wanted to tell a story at the player's pace was was the basic idea it's like how could we do that it seems paradoxical because most games you know use cutscenes or text boxes yep. and, and stuff like that so um one day amir uh, you know amir uh is is childhood friends with a, a logan cunningham who's been our voice actor in every game and he like had him uh had him you know record a few lines put it in there and and it was like it 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 really did something for the game immediately and it happened to line up with the story with the kind of bigger story ideas we had for the game where we kind of converted uh we we the, the story was always going to involve this kind of mysterious old caretaker at this location called the bastion. It's like, wait a minute, the whole story could be from this guy's point of view. Uh -huh. So I came in to do um, all, all the writing and, and Which build is levels. Great, by the way, kudos. Th thank you. Yeah. So, it, so it's just, um, yeah, that was my first shot uh, at. He knocked at it out of the park. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I certainly, um, I was, I was very excited to finally have a chance to do that kind of work. Um, it, it, it meant, it's kind it of melding your two worlds together, right? Yeah, I mean that's what I hoped. Um, but of course, it's one of those things where, like, no one, you, you know, no one would have given me. I could have never gotten that job had I just applied for it. It took, it took, you know, working with a couple of friends who I'd sort of gone through the fire with at EA mm -hmm. um, and who knew and I and I had some opportunities to do some writing at EA like I wrote you know unit responses and things like that when you click on the little you dudes did some like um, videos for EA didn't you yeah there were yeah we did like kind of a almost like an esports -y kind of thing where yeah. I got to do some video I remember work. you hosted some stuff and I was like yeah, oh, yeah. Greg's di dipping his toes back in uh yeah no, a little bit it, it was yeah it was fun um but but yeah um you know, I always, I always hoped to be able to write characters and, you know, help create these worlds and stories and stuff like that. And Bastion was our, our first stab at that. And, and then, you know, it, people liked it. So no, it I meant that it. we could, we could stick around and, and make, <laughs> make, make another one. Yeah. Cause it's all, you know, it was all just, you know, whatever Amir and Gavin, like digging into their savings and stuff like that. But after, after, after Bastion, it meant we could become more of like a real studio. We moved out of the house uh, to a place in San Francisco. <laughs> we started, you know, paying paying ourselves living wages, yep. uh, that sort of thing. So try, trying to make it a more a sustainable endeavor. And I think it was around that time when we're like, hey, let's see. We, yeah, we wanted to see, you know, we and we continue to want to see how long can we sort of keep it going for. And all seven of us uh, from the Bastion days, we're all still there, which is something that we're, 
we feel um, we feel good about. Yeah, because um, because yeah, I mean, life because takes... it's a great place to work that people want to stay. And 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 not only not only that, it's like you know you don't know where what curveballs life is going to throw at you. Just even I just count my I count my blessings. It's like even if it is a great place to work, it doesn't mean that circumstances will be such that everyone can keep doing it. So I'm I'm thankful that that we've all been able to stick together, you know, and a lot of these guys, uh, I was kind of the old man of the group relatively at the start. And these guys are like in their early to mid twenties, the difference between being in your early to mid twenties to like your mid thirties, it's a lot of living that happens. Um, and, is, and, yeah. and you're in a, you're in a really different point in your life. So it's like, we've had to adapt as a studio to just people's people's lives changing. Cause we can't, you know, we were seven people at the time or closer to 20 now, uh, still relatively small. Um, but it's like when, when you have few enough people like that, you can kind of configure, you can configure the way you do things around the people specifically. You don't need like blanket policies that have to cover, yeah. you know, a thousand people. You just well, kind of for account instance, for. You had yeah. a kid, they were in their twenties. They probably didn't. They were probably going out more than you at night, enjoying the nightlife around San Francisco. You had a family. Um, you're right. When you're a smaller team and you know, sort of the demands of the lifestyles of each person, you can kind of cater each, each person's responsibilities around that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even, even just things like work hours, you know, yep. it's like it, just recognizing, and, th and this is something, you know, I, I had to learn myself along the way. It's like it, some, pe some people can be extraordinarily talented, but maybe they don't kind of work effectively in, in this sort of like standard structure that may be yeah. fine for most people. It's like if someone, does amazing work but you know they they just can't get going at 9 a.m or something like that they really get going at 10 or 11 but then they they prefer to you know work a little bit later it's like fine yeah, <laughs> whatever <not? laughs> and 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 working with um yeah and working with people who are these you know like our jen our art director darren our our composer and audio director i i i, I consider them they're like geniuses in their craft. So it's like, whatever, whatever is going to work for you creatively so that you could keep doing your thing, just do it. Like, it doesn't need to be this kind of office-y uh, type of environment um, when, when we're, when we're trying to do this kind of work. So that, yeah, you know, at, at, in our GameSpot days, we were already owned uh, by, by CNET networks. And there was this, even though we were like the scrappy you know, group within CNET, there was still some of this, uh, at least some kind of ethereal pressure of like, well, you know, like get there we, at eight and stay. Yeah, we want to, or we want to, we want to like <laughs> yeah. appear, appear professional within the organization. So they yeah. know what we're all about, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was like that everywhere though, Greg, it wasn't just yeah. us at CNET. Um, that's just work culture. That's the way yeah, it was. Exactly. And I think we've Being seen a... over the last year, a lot of companies are re-examining that. My wife works yeah. for a gigantic corporation and it's been interesting watching them ebb and flow over the last 12 months. And now they're to the point where they're selling off all the real estate and they're like, interesting. a lot of you guys aren't coming back to the office. You know, you've proven in a, this year's time, we don't need that office. We don't need that yeah. square footage anymore. You can function and do very well working from home if you want to. So right. it's been a huge culture shift for a lot of people over the last year. It's interesting that you notice that over a longer stretch of time working in corporate America, really. Right. Um, and then working for more of an independent kind of startup. Um, so you had Bastion was a huge hit. Um, and then your next two games, Transistor and Pyre, I'm not, I'm not sure, honestly, financially, how well those games did. But to me, as an outsider playing the games, they seemed almost more experimental um, than Bastion. Like maybe you guys had some ideas that you're kind of poking around. You're like, okay, we, we can make a salary now. Maybe we can take a little bit more risk. Um, I think Pyre of those two games were pro was probably the bigger surprise to me. Really, a sports game. Yeah. Um, and I, and you know, you know me. Yeah, I'm yeah. a sports guy. I love sports. I love sports games. I was really surprised at Pyre. What what lessons did you guys learn from sort of transistor transistor and Pyre? Yeah, we you know we learned a lot from from each game. And you're 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 right that that there were definitely, you know, for us, for sure, there were experimental qualities in these games. I, I don't, I don't consider, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think they're like, they're not like that experimental, if that makes any sense. But for us, um, they were, you know, with each game, we tried to, we deliberately wanted to kind of step out of our creative comfort zone and do something that, that felt a lot different from the last thing that we did. Um, not because we didn't, you know, we loved, we, we loved and continue to love 
the world of Bastion and the world of each of our games, uh, for that matter. It's just that faced with the faced with the decision to like, well, you know, do you just go make Bastion two because people like Bastion, or or do you go make something else because you know did did you think that you were just going to be the Bastion company or do you have other mm-hmm. ideas? Uh-huh. We 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 set out. We loved kind of the world building um, and the and the experimentation, the the design experimentation that went into Bastion. So we wanted to see if we could basically do it again for Transistor, you know, but but wiping the slate clean. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Pyre, we learned a lot. I think we learned a lot about how to work together effectively and we learned that sort of by the end of the project because it, w- it was a really challenging project because we'd never we'd never had like like a real kind of pre-production phase on one of our games because it was just like Amir and Gavin on Bastion and but but on Transistors like the whole you know the whole team was there from the start yeah um so there um so the game was kind of being pushed and pulled in more directions at the beginning and that and that like that led to new like challenges and discovery. I mean, it was for me personally, it was a very tough uh, project. Um, I think the toughest of the super giant projects for me, if I had to pick one um, and then Pyre, you know, we, we sort of responded to our experience on transistor by letting, by letting everyone just kind of run free and do their thing. And we'll kind of figure out how to pull it all together um, as, as part of the process. Um, and we, we wanted to take kind of an even bigger uh, again, make something even more different, you know, what, because Transistor was a big hit in, in some, in some ways, an even bigger hit than, than Bastion um, for us. And so we thought that like, if we're going to do something wild, um, now's the time. Now's the time. <laughs> yeah, let's try it. And, and, and so we didn't know what the game was, was going to be, but we, um, yeah, we love the, you know, talking to Amir in the early days, this idea of like, the the moment of like retirement in in athletics of like how do you as as the as the star of the team when do you make the decision to sort of hang it up because on the one hand the team needs you you know on the other hand you know you you don't want to sort of out out overstay your welcome yeah overstay your welcome <laughs> exactly and and also on the, on the flip side you know saying goodbye to an old friend like that kind of experience uh-huh. um and and so those were some of the formative ideas like kind of um the yeah like the the kind of spiritual ideas i would say behind pyre but um that that game you know was another three-year project we learned we we learned i think like we we learned a lot of about our kind of it it did push us like creatively kind of even farther and at the end of those three games you know now we had been working together for almost 10 years for about 10 years actually Mm -hmm. now we could finally take stock of like okay how do we work well together? What do we actually enjoy doing? What are we actually good at? Uh, do we really want to keep sort of resetting every single time and and learning everything from scratch every time? Because that is really hard. And there is a risk that we will that that the industry will will pass us by. Like mm-hmm. I would I would draw the analogy of like, hey, we could make like a narrative racing game, for example. Like let's, you know, we can make a racing game with a story and maybe that would be really cool, but you know what? It's going to be a pretty lousy racing game compared to like what the Forza team or something has been doing because they've been perfecting their craft at making racing games. The actual driving part of it. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, we need to, um, we, we need to sort of stay on top of our craft. And if we just discard all of our past ideas every time we start a new project, it's like we're, we're just sort of tying one of our arms behind our backs. And, and moreover, we liked doing some of the stuff on Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre. Why don't we keep doing some of the stuff that we actually enjoyed doing? So Hades was built around some of those ideas. Hey, let's take you know the action of Bastion. Let's take the atmosphere and, and sort of like uh, the, the sort of combat depth of Transistor. Let's take the multi-character like sort of ensemble cast storytelling and narrative techniques of pyre and and mash all that up um so that still sounds like it's a whole new thing but it, it was at least building on things we knew we and felt it is we knew how to do. and it absolutely is yeah. I, I agree a thousand percent hades is your first three games the best parts of your first three yeah. games uh, squeezed down to its essence into one project yeah, th- I, I'm glad it. Uh, I'm glad it comes across that way. Yeah, that was. It, it was certainly 
a compelling idea at the start of that project. It's like, why, why are we making this? Making why are we games forcing is, ourselves to reinvent the wheel every time it, it, exactly. we work on a game? Yeah, even like the 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 story from brief story from Transistor is like it's another you know isometric action RPG. It has some similarities to Bastion, of course. Yeah, but that was not. We spent so much time like re-examining those assumptions. We tried all sorts of different camera angles, you know, all sorts of different sort of ways of navigating the spaces before finally coming back to like, okay, it's going to be isometric. <laughs> You're going to run around. So it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it should have been that hard, but that's, that's an example of, you know, the degree to which we were really stressing the idea that this has to be its own unique thing. It, it should not really be similar to our past work, you know, to stand on its own two feet. Um, but yeah, here's the I, thing about Hades to me is it is a genre like roguelikes. Yeah. I have never really resonated with that subgenre at all. I've tried them all. People have said, this is the one. This is the one that you need to play. This is the one that's going to change your mind. None of them ever did until this one. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Story, uh, story can be a, a powerful tool in games. I think that's been, um, that was another thing like we, that was us, you know, actually to go back to something you said earlier, I personally did notice that each of our games was like threatened to be, it was like more esoteric than the last. That was the word I would use. Yeah. Uh, Transistor was kind of a headier, weirder game than Bastion. And then Pyre is a weirder game in a lot of ways than Transistor. And I'm like, is this really what we want? If is this the to, path we're going to yeah, take? Yeah. If you start to plot this out, um, do we want to just get weirder and weirder every time? Um, and 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 to me, the answer is no. Like because what worked about Bastion, I thought, was that it on the face of it, it's this very simple game with with a lot of pick up and play appeal. Oh, cool! You just start playing, you run around, you hit stuff, fine. Mm -hmm. And then the part where it's an interesting game hopefully washes over you um, once you've started um, kind of coming to grips with it. So th the part where it could be very simple to get into is not at odds with the part where it can be like very interesting and compelling. So with Hades, that was one of the things that we deliberately wanted to go back to just get the player into the action immediately. You shouldn't need, you know, an elaborate tutorial to even understand what the heck you're doing. Um, it should be pretty intuitive. And then from there, the parts that are interesting about it should just start to reveal themselves. So I'm glad um, that, you know, that certainly worked out for us um, on this game. And um, I'm, I'm, yeah. And like, uh, we, we may have some fans that like hoped that we would just get weirder and weirder and more experimental every time. I, I think that, I think that those weird ideas find their ways, find their way into our games. Like there's a lot of wacky stuff in Hades. It's yeah. just, it's just not there right in your face at the beginning. It's not as overt, yeah. Yeah, to make it so that because I think that those those qualities are easier to appreciate once you're like, once you're already absorbed I mean, you have to into be in the, the game. game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then then we have some license to kind of mess with the format and so on. And 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 then the other thing from Bastion is that realization that like story can, you know, when you when you weave the story into this kind of game structure, it's just another way in which it can be uh, compelling to try and move forward uh, because yeah roguelikes are usually purely about the mechanics and um you know the the, the challenge uh, but it's like they also are games that wipe all your progress away every time you die so it can be it can be really deflating to get to those moments and yet what's interesting about those games is the part where you restart and everything is different so we we thought a lot about how to make the inevitable moment of death in those games something that you don't like feel horrible about that um, to me was the big difference yeah with Hades. Now you said earlier that development teams know what they're shipping. Yeah. Did you know what you were shipping with Hades? Did you uh, know it was going to become what it what it has become a game of the year? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> so I guess I'm contradicting <laughs> myself. Um, the, I mean, geez, <sighs> like y y we we've been really fortunate to have made these like our past games have all achieved a level of success, including critical success. Like mm -hmm. Pyre, you know, got like a 9.7 out of 10 from IGN and stuff like that. Yeah, so, I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a well, like um, all of our games have, they've all reviewed like pretty similarly kind mm -hmm. of. Um, so with Hades, especially since it was in early access and we were like getting player feedback, 
I came to realize what, what became clear was that it was definitely our biggest game. And then we were hearing from players that, you know, more, more and more players are like, oh, this is my favorite game that they've made. And we're like, cool. That's because that's a quality we look for. We that's don't you want to hear. You want to build, yeah, right? We don't try to like surpass our past games each time, but we want for each game to have the ability to be uh, someone's favorite game of ours, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, so I, I personally thought that Hades was likely, you know, kind of a marginally better game than our past work. But again, like the standards are, you know, it's three years later, the standards are higher. Um, I, it, it is like, it reviewed not just like a, it reviewed like wildly better than our previous games. So that was very unexpected to me personally. Um, but, but I, as someone who is like, just, I don't know, like, I, I think the standards are so high. I play AAA games as well as independent games. I'm like regularly kind of blown away and mystified. You know, I play these games like Ghost of Tsushima. It's like, how did, human, <laughs> how did human beings like make this stuff? I know, so, it's pretty so the amazing. Part, yeah. So the part where Hades ended up, you know, going toe to toe against these games and game of the year awards uh, is not something I expected. And also like another dimension of it is you, you don't, you know, you can control the quality of your own work. You, you have no say over the kind of context in which it's released. And Hades came out in September. Uh, usually like some, you know, while like more games come out of the woodwork in the, in the fall, like something like, you know, in some alternate reality, a cyberpunk, you know, came out when it was supposed to, and right. not, you know, which would probably not even be yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, like if it was, it was supposed to. Like everyone thought it was going to be the big game last right. year. You know, the game that would get ten out of tens from everybody and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, like, there's some alternate reality where that happened, and Hades got completely overshadowed, right? You know, by by other releases. But we just, yeah, it somehow broke through and just re really resonated with people um it more more than we could have expected so the other it, thing too yeah. is you have early access now which is you yeah. know back in the day it wasn't a thing like it is now no. so in a lot of cases you have a game that you're creating that's out there before it's even really finished and you're getting all the feedback on the unfinished product but it in some ways maybe it it diminishes the day that the game is officially yeah. released right, right. And does That's that concern other... you at all while you're working on games? Are you like, wait, like people have been talking about this and playing it for a while. Maybe when the official quote unquote release date comes, it doesn't have the punch or the impact that maybe we would hope it would have. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like a um, it wasn't a concern per se, in part because the game was already a success in early access. So basically right. the way the way we talked ourselves out of the concern was like, even if nobody gives a crap about our 1.0 launch, we still did, a, we still did fine. Yeah. Like we still did. Okay. We're still going to be able to make another game. Yep. So we, we basically, that helped us sort of lower our expectations Interesting. Uh, for the, for the 1.0 launch. We don't, we don't make like, I don't know. We, we, we've never made, you know, super precise predictions about the, the outcome of these things, but like we knew, we also knew that our major updates in early access were times when, um, you know, we'd get more players and in interest. So we, we did expect that, you know, our 1.0 could do like, could do pretty well. And we were also launching on Switch for the first time. So we were like all crossing our fingers for that, how that would go. Uh, but, you, you know, yeah, it like wildly exceeded uh, <laughs> our, our, our most optimistic sort of hopes and dreams about it. Because, yeah, because to your point, you know, the game had been out there and yet yeah. people, you know, it, I'll take it obviously, but <laughs> yeah. it was, it was treated like this kind of out of left field surprise when it was ironic to me because we were, we were working so hard to like market our updates, you know, for close to two years yeah. to trying to get the word out about this game. And it's like, what is this, this strange new Hades game? It's like, well, <laughs> fine, fine with me. I'm happy with the outcome. But, now why know. switch? Uh, we hear a lot yeah. of people who don't work in development. We hear, you know, anecdotally that indie games sell so much better on switch. One, is that true? And is that why you guys decided to go with switch first? They, um, some of them have is what I would say. Okay. Um, some, some smaller independent games have found a really happy home there um, okay. and, and, and sort of stick around in the bestseller charts uh, really persistently games. I think uh, the ones that come to mind immediately are uh, hollow Knight, uh, stardew Valley, Celeste uh, games yep. like that. So these mm -hmm. happen to be fantastic games. They've been they very are. successful on steam also. Um, but yeah, there's something like the switch is, just a really, really good uh, device for playing these kind of like 
uh, for playing games that are like quick to get into that yeah. way just these kind of like it makes these games feel like new because we even brought you know bastion and transistor to the switch and it just they it, something about it um you felt don't play really it on the go makes yeah, it yeah exactly difference. so yeah. so with hades um part of it was the 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 speculation that maybe this game could could do well here um and and also it just felt really well suited to the format because we uh as mentioned we we designed it in such a way that you could get into the action immediately play it in bite-sized chunks if you want or yep. you know marathon it however you want to slice it um so it just seemed like it would be a natural fit there and that's that's why we um and we'd never launched one of our games uh on a nintendo platform before there was some kind of appeal well even. you're not alone <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, let's be honest i mean switch has been a revelation for nintendo and for a yeah. lot of developers i believe so yeah i think really well deserved i think it's a fantastic system it's a great it's, platform it's a great for series. sure yeah. so now that you guys have your legitimate bona fide smash hit i mean your other games did well financially but hades i'm sure without asking you specifically how well it's done financially is your biggest hit how does a small team like that look at a hit like that? Do you guys say to yourselves, oh, wow, um, we can build a much bigger team now. We can start doing bigger games. Do you look at it like, hey, maybe we can start poking around in like bigger budget games now and start doing things like Assassin's Creed? Or do you say, you know what? This is just proof of concept for us that we need to stay in our lane and keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think it's more the latter thing that okay. you said. We, we don't... Um... The, the, the great thing about the success of Hades is it reinforces to us that we can stick together um, and, and keep doing uh, what we're doing, essentially. And, and we, um, that doesn't mean that we won't, like, we will probably continue to grow, like, a little bit, mm -hmm. but, you know, I don't, I, I don't see us... Um, Suddenly that, exploding that means, to like, 300 people. Or, yeah, exactly. Like that. that means, you know, maybe we'll end up at, I don't know, like 25 people as opposed right. to 20 or something like that. But, but we have no, like being small is, is just fundamental to how we operate. It, it, it constrains what we could do, but we like the constraints. The constraints actually give rise to the kind of ideas that we've had and the kind of solutions that we've had. Things like the narration and Bastion are born of constraints of just like, what, what can we do with the resources that we have? Um, and so if that means that, if that means that it like limits the kind of things that we could do, uh, it, it, it really does. It, it means that it's unlikely that we will go on to make some, whatever, like big, you, you know, that the next thing from us is going to be some wild, like triple A type of experience. I, uh, having said that, I, I don't know what the, what the future holds. It's just the way, the way we talk about it is things are in many ways um, business as usual uh, with, with the, with the like reinforcement that what we have been doing is, is, is sound in some way that, that it's, that our efforts in this have been so like, like, like re rewarded, I guess, like that, that our work has received so much praise. So why would we want to change everything about, how we made something like this happen um why would we do that we don't want to do that we want to like for my part personally i want to i want to keep doing or i wish i could you know devote even more percent of my time to it but like the kind of work we do individually is the kind of work we want to keep doing um so and knowing that people like the outcome of that work great <laughs> so <laughs> that that's um so i think i think yeah i it's funny because I mean, I think, I think we're, we don't have a lot of ambition in that way. We just want to keep, we, um, you know, Darren and Amir, they, they actually were in bands together. They draw an analogy to bands. It's like, if a band has a big album, they don't like, <laughs> they don't like triple the size of the band. They don't add a bunch of new players yeah, to they, the band. They, yeah. They just like, they just go and try and make a different, you know, another album that's worth a damn. We also tell ourselves, I think we're very, uh, you know, we've always tried to avoid falling into the trap of like, let's make our next game even better than our last one. Uh, yep. Cause like I said, if, if we hear from people that, you know, whatever Pyre is their favorite game, they got a tattoo of it. Like, we're not going to tell them that, Oh, well, Hades is even better than Pyre. <laughs> like, th like they love Pyre. That's great. <laughs> that's um, funny. Um, yeah. So we, we just want to make, 
games that are up to our own standard have that capacity to be someone's favorite game of ours. Um, and we know that it is very possible, very likely that um, that Hades Hades might have been might well have been our high point. We should not uh, expect you that. Say that. No, but I. I mean, this you is guys just have my built with every game. I mean, we why have, would you think that that can't continue? I would say just from like a uh, from like a success from like a uh, audience, you know, critical success standpoint. Like the from like it's a hard to beat. Game, I mean, once you get a game of the year candidate, it's it, going to be exactly. Hard to top. It's yeah. it's one it's one more than fifty game of the year awards already. It, basically, it's like we we just should not go into any new endeavor expecting that well yeah. you know we will get a hundred game of the year right, this right. time yeah. I, I i personally think that that's uh, not a good i don't think that that's a healthy mindset personally and and i i would rather it's not it's not that this game is a i don't think that this game is like a fluke for us because it was built in such a deliberate way um and the and the ways the the things it gets recognized for are the things that we did focus on but still uh we we can't just you know it, um, we can't just expect that we we can keep sort of um, <laughs> that that this is the beginning of like a, a series and you know monstrous successes. We don't I even mean, need few like, studios we, can say that that has ever happened. I mean, they have a game of yeah. the year, and then their next game is game of the year, and then their next game is no. It we, doesn't work that way. I don't even want that kind of. I don't even necessarily want that kind of pressure. I mean, I'll take it. You <laughs> it's know, already there, Greg. What are you yeah. talking about? No, it's fine. <laughs> like we've always, you know, that's that's been there since after Bastion, right? And we well, we that's feel why really... your products are good because you already put that pressure on yourselves to create things of that quality. Y y yeah, I think we, um, it's just, I, I think that pressure is good of like, we just, it, we spend three years working on a thing or however long it takes. It's just like, I don't know. It, it, the, the thing I always say is that not only does it take the three years just to make, but for me, at least it, it, it sticks with me forever. Like here yes. we are talking about Bastion, right? So I have, yeah. a, I have a very, I'm very motivated to do my damnedest because I don't want to be stuck I don't want to be stuck with the regret over like over over what the outcome of it was um because that I know that that torments me uh, personally so I want to I want to look back on my work and and know that I did everything I personally could um within reason I guess uh, to to do to do my best work and then you know at least whatever the reception is um at least I could say I gave it my all and I'm okay with that um, that's, that's kind of my own way of making peace with this stuff. Um, and that, yeah. What about a sequel? You guys haven't done a sequel, but now you yeah, have a haven't. game of the year. So do, yeah. does that it's, change? It's a, it's a, you know, we like to, we like to surprise, um, we've talked about We've considered sequels every. You don't have to tell time. me if, if it's coming. Like I'm not trying oh, no, to no. like get a hot. <laughs> Believe me, like, I won't. Um, I'm not trying to break something no, no, here. I'm just saying, like, is your yeah. perspective changed? Whereas before, maybe that wasn't even something you consider. Now, is yeah. it something that you consider? It, it hasn't. Our perspective hasn't changed because it's always been something that we considered. Okay. Um, we we have. It's funny that we've never made one because we have like I, I think some of our fans may think you know we have like something against them uh -huh. i think it's out of it's um we've never made a sequel in part because we've been so excited to make something new each time and also i have a lot of like fear and respect for sequels i think sequels are like deceptively they're like people think they're like easier than they are <laughs> I, I think to i think to make a good one like my fear around sequels is you can you can just you know, there you can think of like film franchises where the sequel may have like retroactively ruined the first movie uh -huh. for you or whatever. There, there's like a big, you, you have to do right by the thing, um, and and kind of live up to the spirit of it. And a, a big part of our games is is the, I I think what's you know people like, our our games can be surprising to players, and and with a with a sequel, you know how can you surprise the players again? And I, I I've I've thought about those kind of issues. Um, all through the years. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's something, it's something we do think about, but I think uh, we, we do value that element of, of surprise. So I hope, I hope we can keep our players on our toes a little bit where they, they won't, they won't 
when we ourselves don't quite know what we're going to do, I think it's I think it's good because it means, you know, we can surprise ourselves and hopefully surprise our players. And I think I think surprise is like sort of an underrated aspect of uh, how an undervalued aspect of, of games. Um, like when games can surprise you, it's it's a really big deal. You talk about platformers. That's like oh, a good for example. For me especially. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really yeah, big deal. <laughs> yeah, for me too. We we try to we just try to do things in different ways each time, not, not for the sake of it, just to keep, yeah, to keep it interesting for ourselves. It's like, we, you know, we've, d- we've seen this before. We've done this before. Like that's, that's not, we already did this in, you know, in transistor pyre or whatever. So we, we try to spin things differently. That's another part of the reason I think we've never done a sequel as it has all those challenges. Like how are you not just sort of retreading all the, all the same territory, but who knows the, the, the sky is, is uh, the limit for us right now. And it, it takes us a long time. We never know what we're going to make uh, next until after we're done working on a thing. Um, so we're we're just kind of beginning to have some of those conversations now of like, well, what do we even what do we even do from here? In part because we've been yeah we've been so busy like supporting uh, Haiti since since the launch. A fortunate problem to have. Yep. So Greg, before we go, every guest on Three Night Weekend, we ask them one set of questions. What yes. this weekend? What are you playing? What are you watching and what are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, the what am I playing? I have been playing Loop Hero a lot. Okay. But I think I'm I may not be, surprised to hear that at all. <laughs> yeah, I think I may be done with Loop Hero, though, because um, I kind of got to the point where I'm like, OK, I think I get it. And uh-huh. I, I, I feel a little bit burned out on it now, but I played it all this last weekend. So that's why I have one of the backlog games that has like bubbled up for me a lot is uh, I really want to play Yakuza like a dragon. And I've been looking for an excuse to, to dig into that game. So maybe it's time uh, that I pick that up. Um, what am I watching? Um, you know, do you with, watch a lot of TV and film? Uh, I, I, I watch a decent amount, not as much as I should. I've been back on like a freaking anime kick of all oh, things. Interesting. Um, yeah, I've always there's there's like some interesting stuff out there lately. Uh, like? But um, there uh, there's like, like a, well, what's one thing you would recommend for our listeners? Well, there's like the big the big hit show is is called Demon Slayer. It's on Netflix. Um, I thought it started really strong the first couple of episodes, and then it's kind of like it's it's gone into the rut i that feels like uh, anime in yeah a nutshell it, it, to it me. happens for me <laughs> yeah but but there's a yeah so i'm 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 kind of sampling i'm not that super engaged with it i'm just kind of sampling stuff that's come out recently uh just to is it's been it seems like a lot of stuff has come out that i've been seeing discussion about um and with wandavision over you know what are we going to watch now um, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually do want to, I really want to see that, um, Raya and the last drag, uh, and the last dragon movie, the new Disney movie yep. for, for 30 bucks on top of your, uh, Disney plus <laughs> subscription. But it sounds, I, I actually, uh, like, um, I, I like Disney's kind of mainline animated movies. Uh, they're, they're ever since tangled, they've, they've mostly been on like a, I, I think they've had a really good run of, um, of, uh, their kind of CG animated movies. So, agreed. Um, so I might see that, and and as for what I'm, what I'm drinking, I think I've been more, uh, more in, on the whiskey side of things. I, I recently. Are you a big just, Scotch guy? Not, uh, not really. I never have been, but we just. I think you know we. I went to Japan for the first time mm-hmm. in like 20 years. It took my whole family. Is the last trip we went on before everything happened. That, that was like, what it was close to three years, two, three years ago now or something. And they, 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 uh, there's a drink there that's often served called the highball, which is just whiskey and like club soda, basically on mm-hmm. ice. And it was like, oh, wait, this is really good. And it's <laughs> low calorie and stuff like that. So my, <laughs> at our so, age, you have to yeah, worry yeah, yeah. about that stuff. Yeah. So, so it's all, you know, we, we still make uh, the highballs around here from time to time. And I, yeah. So that is, that is what, uh, I think that is what I will be. And we usually have like a, a beer or something on try to save like a Belgian beer or something for weekends as well. We, we went to, yeah, went to Belgium also some years back. And that was a, that was a wonderful, 
It's an eye opener. You can't have yeah. too many Belgian beers, though. Are you gonna? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty in, strong. intense. Yeah, absolutely. Once so a Greg, week or so. Yeah. yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's yeah, been great to sure. catch up with you. I wish I got to bump into you more often, but typically when two people work really hard, you don't run it. <laughs> those two people yeah. don't run into each other all that often. Um, again, I appreciate everything you did for me throughout my career. I still, to this day, when I'm thinking about things editorially, I will still hear your voice in my head when Thanks. I think about certain things. I mean, that's the type of impact uh, that you've had on my career. So thank you very much. Thank and you, most Shane. importantly, congratulations on all the success at Supergiant. And I cannot wait to see what you guys do next. Thank you. Thanks so much. you want to reach out to Greg, you can find him on Twitter at Kasavin. That's K-A-S-A-V-I-N. And now that you know what he's up to this weekend, it's time to figure out things for yourself. Games! Ooh, it's a slow weekend for video games, so maybe you should just go pick up Valheim on Steam for 20 bucks. But if not, there is Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time. It is launching for Switch, PS5, and Xbox Series X today. TV and film! Likewise, if you're looking to plant your butt on the couch this weekend, maybe it's a good time for you to head out and get some fresh air. We can all probably use a little bit of that right now. Uh, there are a few things worth checking out, though. Isabel Season 1 launches on HBO Max this weekend. It is a docu-series about a popular Chilean writer. Uh, next up is Cosmic Sin with Bruce Willis. It is launching on VOD this weekend, and the best way you could describe it is kind of like Aliens Without the Name boy, what is Bruce doing these days? It's crazy. Uh, next up is a movie called Cherry that's premiering on Apple TV. It stars Tom Holland as an Iraq war vet with PTSD who becomes a bank robber. It's been getting a lot of positive buzz from critics. Definitely worth checking out. Also on Netflix this weekend, a new series called The One Debuts, and it's about using your DNA to find your perfect soulmate. And then finally, if you got sucked in by WandaVision on Disney Plus over the last month and a half or so, the making of that series is also premiering on Disney Plus. Music! If you're into heavy music or metal, it is a good week of album releases for you. Probably the biggest of which is Rob Zombie. His first album in six years is releasing today. It's called The Lunar Injection Kool-Aid Eclipse Conspiracy. That's a mouthful, but one thing I will say is it is a return to form for Rob Zombie. It's really heavy, some light electronics, but for the most part, definitely going to get your head ringing. And then there's also a band called I Hate God, and that's spelled E-Y-E, -E, hate God, all one word. Its new album is called A History of Nomadic Behavior. It's kind of slower, chuggy metal, like Rage Against the Machine, uh, so check that out. And then on the indie front, there's a band called The Anchoress. And their new album called The Art of Losing is kind of like electro rock with female vocals um, and strong social messaging as well. That's out today. And then finally, Valerie June. She's a singer-songwriter in the vein of Alabama Shakes, just with a little bit more R&B and soul influence. Her new album is also out today. Sports! Lots of sports going on this weekend, not the least of which is a ton of NCAA basketball. In fact, if you don't like NCAA basketball, it's a terrible weekend for live sports. Uh, there are tons of conference tournaments going on all weekend long, trying to figure out who's going to get into the final round for March Madness. And that's across ESPN, CBS Sports, NBC, pretty much everywhere. You're not going to be able to escape college basketball this weekend. But there are other things going on as well. Um, let's see, there's not a single nationally televised NBA game on today, which is a huge rarity. They're just kind of getting out of the way for March Madness stuff, but there is a really good NHL game on tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern on NHL Network. It's the Vegas Golden Knights at the St. Louis Blues, two of the leaders in their division. Moving on to Saturday, even Premier League soccer has been uh, pared down a little bit for this weekend. It's 7.25 a.m. Eastern. It's Leeds United versus Chelsea. And then at 9.55 a.m., it's Crystal Palace versus West Brom. Both those games are on NBCSN. And for the first time in weeks, there's not a single nationally televised game on NBC from the Premier League. Then at 7 p.m. Eastern on NBA TV, it's the Pistons at the Nets. But again, on Saturday, not a single nationally televised NBA game. If you're into golf, the uh, 2021 Players' Championship, the third round kicks off on NBC at 1 p.m. And then in the evening, my Pittsburgh Penguins take on the Buffalo Sabres at 7 p.m. Eastern on NHL Network. Moving on to Sunday, again, two Premier League soccer games going on early on in the day on NBCSN. 
Arsenal versus Tottenham is at 12.25 Eastern. And Manchester United versus West Ham United is going down at 3.10 Eastern. And then the final round of the Players' Championship kicks off at 1 p.m. on NBC if you're into some golf. And then finally, there are some big NBA games going on on Sunday. And there is a national game, which is the Los Angeles Clippers at the New Orleans Pelicans at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then if you're into the NHL, the surprising Los Angeles Kings take on the Colorado Avalanche at 7 p.m. Eastern on NBCSN. And then if you like the perpetual left-hand turn, the NASCAR Instacart 500 is happening on Fox at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Esports. Four big tournaments are going on this weekend. The Valorant VCT Masters 1 Stage 1 Europe is going on all weekend. The 2021 Hearthstone Master Tour Iron Forge is also going on all weekend. Uh, The Fortnite Champion Series Chapter 2 Season 5 worth 2.7 million dollars is happening all weekend and then finally the rainbow six siege japan league is going down on saturday and sunday and the purse there is 305k all right that's it thanks for checking out three night weekend from sifted games at sifted.net if you want to get it when it's hot and fresh head to patreon.com slash sifted and give us a pledge Uh, if you give us four dollars a month or more you'll get this every friday morning if you want to know when the show is posted for free follow us on twitter at sifted games and if you want to reach out to me and suggest future guests you can find me at dinfire i'm shane satterfield reminding you that every weekend is a three-night weekend